Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Wednesday. It is the 13th day of December, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well. A nice day out there for, for December. I wasn't there wasn't much of a wind, beautiful, beautiful stars out there tonight, too. I'm not sure I, I, I should know the phases of the moon, but right now it's a really dark sky, so you can get out there and see Orion, the Pleiades, a couple of the planets, a few other, a few of the constel, uh, the zodiac constellations, they're, they're always pretty cool. So it's just a really nice time to look at the stars. Uh, I think it's supposed to be pretty mild the next couple of days, and rain is supposed to come in later in the weekend. Anyway, we've had a wonderful meal provided by the Lutheran Women's Missionary League. The food was excellent. Uh, I think we ran out, it was, so we had a lot of people there tonight. Uh, so that was that was, I mean, you know, that was really nice. Uh, that uh, um, there weren't a lot of leftovers and things like that. Uh, also, um, we had evening prayer, midweek service. Uh, next week will be uh, the Wednesday service will be the children's Christmas program, and then of course following that, so it's a week. From this coming weekend, we'll be we'll do the whole Christmas cycle. So remember that Sunday, the twenty fourth, is also the fourth Sunday in Advent. That's on a Sunday this year, and which I just said we. Uh, so we'll have the fourth Sunday in Advent at nine o'clock on Saturday or on Sunday morning. That afternoon and evening, we'll celebrate Christmas Eve, candlelight service being at six thirty that evening, and uh, have our first celebration of Christmas. And then on, on Monday morning, 9 o'clock, the Feast of the Nativity, which is not a well-attended service. Uh, uh, and I, I mentioned before, just to encourage if you're in town to come, uh, we will sing more Christmas hymns. hymns we will, we'll, they'll be the, the sort of the standards for Christmas Day, but not the same ones that we sing on Christmas Eve. Uh, also, there's a different gospel. There's, it's, it's the first chapter of John. In the beginning was the word where uh, the evening service, Christmas Eve service, we have the reading of Luke, the, the traditional Christmas story with the shepherds and uh, the manger. Anyway, so the sermons are different. The focus of the service is still our, our Lord. So, uh, you know, try to, if you're not in the habit of coming to both of those, if you're not traveling or don't have a house full and stuff like that, maybe make it a habit to come. And if you do have a house full, invite them to come with you. And that, that's a nice witness when you go. Uh, certainly, we've had guests in our house over the years. Maybe they didn't want to go, or they were not feeling well, or something like that. That's fine. But everybody's welcome to come. Everybody's welcome to come. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. So tonight we read from um, Revelation chapter 1. And it is not Revelations, it is Revelations. It's going to drive me nuts, my college cricket. Okay. It is, uh, I've got help. Okay. Um, there we go. Better. It, it, it Actually, the title should be The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The Apocalypse is a Greek word that means revelation. And it's singular, not revelations. It's, it's one of my, you know, I'm, I have lots of pet peeves. I suppose everybody does. I have a lot. Um, that's one of them, Revelation Singular. And uh, uh, it's all, I think the formal title in my Greek Testament is the Apocalypse of John. It is a revelation given to John, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to read chapter 1 this evening. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, 
To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And on the midst, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And that is the word of the Lord. And that is a remarkable word. Now, we want to set some ground rules here. Uh, it is interesting there are a number of churches, and I, I suppose this is because of dispensationalism, and maybe its roots are in pietism and the divorcing of the work of the Holy Spirit. According to pietism, that's not true, but it's where they get it wrong. Divorce the work of the Holy Spirit from the means of grace. And so you got to start looking for crazy stuff. And you can find it in Revelation. So we're not going to let that happen, though. Uh, and here's why. So... First of all, when you are interpreting scripture, you know, one of the things you got to think about is genre, right? Uh, the way I approach in English, I'm just working with English, and I'm, I keep looking at my Greek New Testament over here, I have the urge to get it out and look at a few things, but not, we can have a class on Revelation at some point in the near future. And the, anyway, it is, you, you know, when I'm approaching, trying to understand poetry, you know, I have to, First thing I realized, it's poetry. Now, it might be free verse. Don't care for that all that much. So some of it, I run into a few things that are very good. Uh, I, I tend to like a, a meter. Uh, anyway, um, you know, but you, you know, poetry is characterized by sentence fragments, a lot of metaphor, sim a lot of metaphor, uh, sim you know, symbolism, like I'm saying the same thing there. And, uh, and so you approach it when you're, when you're interpreting, you're, you know, what let's just like a simple English poem. Okay, what you know, is there a meaning behind this and what is the author's meaning? Why did he use these metaphors? Same thing with scripture, particularly the Psalms. The Psalms don't use they use a lot of metaphor, of course, uh, as as parables and things like that. So I have you know, any that's another example. So I'm looking at a parable, I've realized this is a parable. Okay, it's not and you have to be careful with parables because we kinda wanna sometimes push them to beyond what I think our Lord had intended, meaning, you know, we start reading all these things into it. Well, all you have is the parable. And one of the things you remember, you know, we, it, all about all scripture, it's all about Jesus, including the parables. Uh, people forget that. They always, we always make, make ourselves the center of those things. But we're in there, certainly, but Jesus is the center of everything. So this, this is not narrative, um, like the Gospels and the Torah, that's the first five books and the historical books, are more narrative. Although there's little sprinklings of, of different genres in those, poetry, and then apocalyptic literature, pieces of Daniel, uh, uh, Isaiah, um, 
Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel's a big one, Daniel 2. Um, and then Revelation. So one of the hallmarks of that genre, you know, a lot of metaphor, once again, a lot of symbolism. And in the case of Revelation, it's not linear. It's cyclical. And we're going to look at some things, and I just want to set this groundwork because I, I don't want you to get bogged down in some things. Uh, the problem is, like, people who don't understand that, they start with Revelation because you can make it mean anything if you don't sort of play by some just simple rules for interpretation. The rules being, uh, you know, that, okay, when I look at a piece of literature like this and I realize it's highly symbolic, how am I going to start to unpack it? I'm going to go to the, the very clear texts uh, you know, that are recorded in, elsewhere in the Bible. So in the case of, let's, for example, say, like, when is Jesus coming back? And it's already alluded to here. Uh, people have been trying to figure it out for a long time, for a very long time. Looking at Revelation, oh, you know, in interpreting these signs and wonders is, is like, oh, this is going on here and this is going on. I've heard a lot of crazy stuff over the years. What does Jesus say about it? What does he say very clearly? Same Jesus that's speaking here. He says, no one knows the day or the hour. Not even him and his humanity. So I'm going to stop guessing. I mean, I can think, well, it's got to be near. I wouldn't be alone in that. But I'm not going to stand in front of you and preach sermons and write books about it's going to be next Thursday at 2 p.m. because of this and Revelation and that. You can't do that. So that's a big thing when we approach approach the interpretation of, of apocalyptic literature. We look first and foremost of what's told to us simply and clearly. And then use that knowledge, those words of Scripture, to come and help us unlock this. So let's do that now. We have, again, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave um, him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel, so our Lord and Savior's angel, to John, who bears witness about the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and hears it out loud and keep, uh, and, and who keep what is written in, for the time is near. So then we, that's sort of an introduction, and then we get to the seven churches that are in Asia. They're listed for us, and they're going to figure prominently in these first couple of, of chapters. We hear the apostolic greeting, grace to you and peace from him who, and then we hear this, who is, and who was, and who is to come, or simply I am. Uh, you know, there's never been a not him. Uh, and from the seven spirits, that's that perfect number of God who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So we hear you know, the, 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 uh, uh, we, we, the, the Trinity is beginning to be put before us there. And we hear what? He's the firstborn of the dead. You know, Paul's already talked about that. Uh, that he is, and think about that. You know, Adam was the firstborn of all the living. Jesus is the firstborn of all the dead. Those of us who are under the curse because Adam was, was disobedient. So we are dead, if you will, the, the walking dead. Jesus is the firstborn from us. You know, of course, through the Virgin Mary and God being his father, things we're going to uh, um, hear about on Christmas Day, that is that he is fully God, fully man. But he is the firstborn from among us. So in him now, there's life. You know, he, he you know he's born out of that. Uh, I know it's gonna, that's going to become more explicit in this, but it's just interesting that he's given that title. The, the for, he's faithful, and what he has done, and what he gives to us, and you know he is the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of everything on the earth, and really rule of everything. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And notice what, what John is saying right here. He's saying, okay, this is the reality in which we all walk. As this book unfolds in this, in, in this sort of cyclical uh, pattern, one of the things that we're hearing right at the beginning is what we are. I think you're going to get a sermon about in that way too. Remember, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, uh, for theirs is. The reality in which you live now, even though you don't see it, this is what you are. This is what's yours. So, uh, we are free um, from our sins by his blood. Now, you know, he washed over you in his baptism, in your baptism. He made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father, so we are the royal priesthood. Uh, Peter uses that language. It's not the only place that's used in the New Testament, but I think Peter is a prominent one. Uh, and we're also his kingdom. You know, we, we're, we, are, we are grafted in the kingdom of, into the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then, you know, there's this little doxology, glory, dominion forever and ever, and then, Notice the statement, this is true. Now we have another statement, and we have another amen. So it's going to bracket this. So we hear amen. So this is true. That's what that word amen means. We don't turn it into some pietistic drill. It's just a statement that this is true. 
amen. It's not, you know, we say amen sometimes. It's like, you know, I'm giving my amen to something. The truth isn't, the truth is uh, not there for you to give your amen to, but simply to acknowledge. That's what the word amen does. And the truth is still the truth, whether you refuse to believe it or not. I was listening to a podcast on the way home tonight. I listened to a lot of things like that. Just And I listened to good stuff. You heard me say that before. And they were talking about a high-level academic in our country that you know, that often phrases uh, this high-level academic. The language that he or she uses is, you know, well, my truth is. You know, is that what happens at uh, universities? It's a, uh, a world-class university, at least on paper, uh, of... Uh, uh, of uh, uh, the work you know that this person works at, and you think, wow, that's what you teach your students that they're you know that you can have your truth and I can have mine. The truth is is there whether you agree with it or not. Um, you know, the sky is blue whether I think it is or not. Uh, I can say, well, I, my truth is is that it's it's uh, fuchsia, uh, um, puce, ah, ugly color. Uh, let's say, but I want to believe it's puce, you know, and and I believe it's puce, so it doesn't change the truth that it's not. Um, so notice we have this bracketing here. Amen. Behold, he is coming. So this is, here's the truth. He is, and it's all truth. He is coming with the clouds. Everyone's going to see him. So right out of the, you know, before we start, you know, unpacking, oh, where is he? And what is he doing? And, and trying to unpack the mysteries of Revelation and apply them, apply them to all the things we see and come up with some cockamamie schemes. He's telling us, everyone will see him, even those who pierce them. And all the tribes of the earth will wail. There's, you know, there's going to be a judgment will wail on account of him. Even so, it's still true. We may not want to believe that. We may not, we may not want to believe that there's going to be a judgment and there will be. Uh, how that's going to unfold and what it's going to look like, that's for God to worry about, not me. He says he's the one that takes care of that, not you or not me. Uh, he is the judge. We're not. But there's going to be wailing. Even so, this is still true. Whether you like it or not, he is coming back. And then I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. There is no other. It means everything. Everything from the beginning to end, everything in between. Um, that's what he is. It says the Lord God who was. And so another, it's saying another way, who was and who is, or who is, who was, and who is to come. And we heard language like that already. Um, we heard who is and who was and who is to come uh, when John gets this greeting at the end uh, uh, or at the beginning. So now we hear that he's having, John is having this vision, he's on Pamos, he's exiled there, and he hears the Lord speak, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it and it's a voice that sounds like a loud trumpet, like thunderous waters, it's described that. It's terrifying. We hear the list of the seven churches. We're going to hear more about them. He turns to see and he sees this terrifying image, face shining like the sun in full strength. It must have hurt to try to look at it. Voice like thunderous waters with the sword coming out of his mouth. I mean, artists try to capture I'm going to put an art on the youth, uh, uh, woodcut, Albert Durer woodcut, um, on the uh, YouTube page tonight uh, as the lead-in picture of this. And you'll see that, you know, how he tried to capture it. You know, the, the stars in the hand and the feet like uh, burnished bronze. And it's terrifying. So this is where it gets really cool, though, because when we have an encounter like that, it's going to terrify us. When we see Jesus coming back, we're going to be terrified. So John falls down because he realizes what's going on. He's seeing who Jesus, is. you know, this is the same John who rested his head on Jesus' shoulder, but he sees who he really is, you know, the Almighty God, and hears him in a way he's never heard before. Maybe I have a glimpse of it at the, at, at the Transfiguration, but not quite like this. And he falls down as though dead. You can think of Isaiah, woe to me, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst people of unclean lips, meaning I'm going to die. And... Uh, 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 remember, God says you can't see my face and die and live. So notice, fear not. After John falls down, he's, he's dead. Jesus touches him. He lays his right hand, his hand on him. And notice when we, we often um, make the sign of the cross in the church, that's the hand we hold up with these texts in mind. Now, if I use the wrong hand, you know, no one goes to hell and I don't get struck by lightning. But we, we try to capture with our movements the symbolism, you know, with the symbolism of our movements, what uh, Scripture is teaching us. So he, he touches him with his right hand. He lays it on him. You, know, you can imagine John falling out of and he just puts his hand on him. It's a very comforting thing. But then this voice, the thunderous waters, fear not. You know, um, I am the first and the last, the living one. Not, you know, so that means 
yeah, that's how you know, he's never not going to be dead. Not alive. You know, not uh, he's he's alive. You know, he is the one who was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. The living one. He's the slaughtered one forever. He's the living one forever. Um, you know, all these other titles we can give about who he is uh, as the eternal God in our flesh. That means in him we have those same things. When we participate, partake of his flesh, and when it comes upon us in baptism, I'm thinking of the Lord's Supper predominantly here, we partake of the living one. You are what you eat. You know, he, he nourishes you with what's living, you know, the true living flesh. Uh, I died and behold him alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He has opened, he's broken it open from the inside. And it now has to, this is a favorite phrase of mine when I preach, especially when we're thinking about death in the text, that remember, the Lord who baptized you, the Lord who feeds you in the font, he, you know, or in the, uh, from the altar, he holds the keys of death and Hades. So that means death and Hades, he's, he can unlock it. It has to do what he says. All right, uh, it can't hold you. It didn't hold him, it can't hold you. When, so when he says to you, get up, death says, let him go. Because Jesus owns it. So, when he says, write what you see uh, to the lampstands and, and what's to come. So we'll stop there. And we're going to remember, though, that, you know, this is a specific genre. And what we're hearing so far is, it's not all, except for the way Jesus looks, it's not, we're not dealing with super symbolic language. It's all, you know, telling us again what Jesus said as he walked among us. Uh, but just painting it in some very beautiful just some beautiful but very clear language for us. And, you know, so we're already being told the reality in which we live as people, and that's going to be important as we move forward. All right. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the marriages and the families of your people, our community, that we'd uphold this precious gift um, as something to be cherished and nurtured and be honored among us. The husbands and wives, parents and children would live according to your word, according to the harmony that you, harmony you establish for us. We, as always, pray for parents who must raise their children alone. Strengthen them in that most difficult of tasks. Keep them from falling into despair and loneliness and be with us. Um, their neighbors, that we may help them as we are able. Heavenly Father, we pray that we, as we uphold these gifts, would be a blessing, we would share your blessings and go forth with your blessings in our communities and neighborhoods. They too would come to see these gifts and cherish them and uphold them as well. Heavenly Father, we ask you as always to be with those who cry, are crying out to you for healing, for, bed, for, for Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Ardo, Klaus, Lou Ray, Pat, Pam, Mary Ann, Cecil, Bob, Jenny, Aaron, Allison, Allie, Fern, Don, Amy, Scott, Ashley, Camden, Jason, Bob, Jim, Clint, Beth, Eric, Tom, Paul, Brad, Christy, Jeff, Dylan, Dave, Anita, Marlis, Jeremy, Karen, Sue, Tim, Ron, Bert, Heather, John, Chris, Lori, Don, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, Michelle, Bethany, and all who cry out to you. Heavenly Father, according to your good and gracious will, place your healing hand upon them. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. 
But I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. With your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I am going to turn to page or hymn 384 of the Father's Love Begotten, which we will sing in its entirety on Christmas Day. It's an ancient hymn written by a Spaniard by the name of Aurelius Prudentius Clemens, who died in the year 413. There's a couple of hymns older than this in my hymnal, but this is one of the oldest, and it's also one of my favorites. Uh, it's also a very old melody, beautiful, and a bit of a haunting melody. Uh, so I'm going to sing, it's a very creedal hymn, too. So I am going to sing stanza one, there are five altogether. Of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending, He. Of the things that are that have been, And that future ye shall see. Evermore and evermore. Amen. So that's stanza one. With that, my brothers and sisters, with the Amen tacked on. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed rest. By God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.